I want to tell our story for just a few minutes. I'm going to get to the scriptures here in a minute. But I think it's important for some of you who have not heard the story. A lot of you have lived this story, so you don't need to hear it. But a lot of you are new, and you haven't heard the story of how we got here. And um, like telling any story, it's kind of in the eye of a holder. I've once heard the definition of history is what historians write. And the winners get to write the history. So uh, understand this is history from my perspective of how we got here. It started long before me. I've been here, be 13 years in August. So I've been a big part of the story, but it started long before me. It actually started in the mid to late 80s. After we had purchased the Dillard's building, there was a lady who came to see me when we were over in our other campus. And she introduced herself, but I didn't hear her name, and I didn't catch her name. I wish I would have. I've never seen this lady since. But she came in. She says, I want to tell you something. And I said, well, okay. She said, back in the 80s, mid to late 80s, she said there were some ladies who prayed all over town for revival to come to Texas City. I later have found some of our ladies were involved in that prayer session, but none of them came to this location. And she said that this was an open field, and they, a group of ladies came to this field, and she said, I promise you we were praying right on the spot where the Dillard store would be. And she said, we were praying for a revival. She, but she said, one lady just really got caught up in the spirit of the prayer and spirit and prayer and started praying, Lord, I pray that there be a significant, powerful, spirit-filled church be on this very site someday. Now, a couple of years later, they built a mall on it. I'm sure she thought that that wouldn't happen. Uh, but guess what? Uh, God had Dillard's provide us a pretty nice building here. And uh, so I think that's where it started. Our church was meeting at the Ninth Avenue location across from the football field. Had been there since uh, the 50s. And uh, in about 1990, I believe it was, about 30 years ago, uh, there was a feeling that the church might ought to look to build and maybe either do two locations or maybe have a satellite with the idea that we would move the location out there. Now, this is back 30 years ago. So the church put together a committee to start looking for land. Dickie, you were on that committee, I believe, were you not? I think maybe some others of you might have been on that committee, and they looked and they searched, and they found a piece of land that they brought back to the church. It's now where St. John's Methodist Church is. But they came and presented that that's probably where we ought to buy, maybe put a location out there. And uh, the church vote was 70 to 30 percent. The pastor at that time, the leadership, felt like that was not a strong enough vote to, to do that. So they backed off that, decided we'll just stay where we're at. And so uh, a group of folks did leave the church and came out and started the mainland church. And it flourished for a while, but now not doing so well. Okay, now fast forward, that's where it began. A little over 13 years ago, the church was without a pastor, and w during that time they did an intentional interim, and part of the intentional interim was that they put a transition committee together to talk about goals and things that they would have for when the new pastor came. One of the recommendations of the transition committee was that we sell the property there and that we move out to the west part, which is out here. The uh, transition committee report passed 100%. Those are a lot easier to pass than when you actually go to do something, I've found. But 13 years ago, Mother's Day, this past May, uh, they, the committee had already talked to me about coming in view of a call, and they told me about the transition committee report, and I was asked, would you be opposed to helping lead our church to make a transition to the other side of town. And I said, no, I'd be happy to do that. I've been in many building projects and paying off buildings other people had built. I've been done that a lot. And so I said, I'd be, be happy to do that. 
And so I think what had happened was, and Brad, I think I got this story straight, you and the super, Brad Jackson and the superintendent had a walk one day. Brad's holding his head down now, but I, I think I got the story right, that he, they had been on a walk, and the superintendent said, do you think your church would be open to selling the property? Because they wanted it for a vocational building, which there is one there today. And so Brad took it to the deacons. The deacons talked about it, and... Uh, then they brought it to the church on Mother's Day, and they had a very interesting business meeting on a Sunday morning. And the church voted to uh, what the superintendent, I understand it, had done. He said, have the church tell us, make an offer and tell them, say, hey, we'll take this for your church, and I'll take it to the school board. And so apparently the church had a very interesting day that day, but voted about 70% to 30% to move, to take it to the school board to see if they would sell it. I came in view of a call in June. And it was all on go. We're going to be selling to the school and we'll be moving. And so because of some obligations I had, I could not come on the church field until mid-August. And so between June and mid-August that deal fell apart. I'll tell you why the deal fell apart. Some of our church members, a couple of them that I know of, who are no longer members here, I should say, but a couple of them called all the school board members and yelled at them for wanting to get our church. And uh, so the school board members didn't know anything about it, and so they, they backed off and said, no, we're not going to get in the middle of that church fight. So when I came in August, that deal was off the table, and so I thought, okay, you know, God just works different ways. You just go with doors God opens for you, right? I thought maybe he wants us to stay here. So I came with the intention of staying here. Well, a little over a year after I was uh, pastoring, one of our members, Ben Breedlove, was a school board member out here at Mainland Christian School, and they were in trouble financially. The church that had built that, that from group from our church, had uh, dwindled down to just a handful of folks, and they could not no longer make payments and do things, and so they were about to cut them off, and the school couldn't make payments, and so he said, would you all, there's been there, and uh, you all can tell me if I'm lying, and, uh, but uh, so the school board offered that place to us, and we kind of did a lease purchase, and making a long story short, we ended up buying that place with 30 acres on I-45. Sounds like a good place to have a church, right? So we were there, and uh, we met one church, two locations for quite a while, several years. Uh, I preached there, and then I would leave there and go down and preach at our other place. I came in late at the other place and did that for a long time. I uh, would never do that again, but uh, I, I did it then. But uh, we did two locations, and I thought, well, maybe this is what's going to happen, but what I realized very quickly is we just didn't have the staff to, to staff two locations. We just didn't have the money to staff, and we just couldn't do two locations. It became very difficult, very costly to try and keep two, building, two buildings up. And so the school made another run at us saying, we still want to do a vocational uh, school there on your property. Would you be open to selling that? And I said, okay, we'll do that, but we're going to do it different this time you all take it to the board first and then come to us. And when the board says it's, they want to do it, then we'll take the vote because I knew it would be controversial again. And so the board did. The board made us an offer. And so we had a Sunday morning vote, and it was the worst vote of all three. We only did 68% that day. It takes a two-thirds vote to, to, to do anything with property. My instincts with a close vote like that is to say, well, we probably shouldn't do it. I probably would have been with Jay Gross, who back in the 90s said, hey, it's too close a vote. But I got to praying about it and got to looking at it. I thought, this has been three votes. The majority have said, we think we ought to move. It's time majority rules. And so we, we went ahead and sold to the school. I was fearful that we wouldn't have everybody come. But what soon became uh, apparent is a lot of the problem wasn't so much selling the building. It was 
where we were going to move to. I don't know why. It's just about a mile down the road. But our folks just did not like that location. And uh, I don't know why. But uh, I think God was speaking through them. But a lot of them had done that. I remember Dr. Hart came to me and he says, Robert, I'll vote to do this. But you have to agree that within one year, we'll be building a new worship center. I don't want to worship in a gym. And uh, I said, okay, Doc, we'll do our best. And I said, I can't promise, but we'll do our best. Well, anyway, in the meantime, Jimmy Haley, who is the uh, Chamber of Commerce president at the time, and he and Jerome, and Jerome had a partner at that time. Jerome owns the rest of the mall now. But uh, Jerome had a partner, Chris, and they were wanting to sell this building. And so he and Jimmy was saying, who would be who would like to do this? Well, Jimmy, I think actually had been a member of our church for a while. He wasn't at the time, but Jimmy knew a lot of our folks, knew a lot of our folks were resisting going to that property. So he said, you know, I think First Baptist might be interested in that building. It's been about six years ago, folks. So, And, uh, and so Jerome called me and said, would y'all be interested? And I said, well, we might. And uh, I'm, I'm serious. I, we, we, we were talking, and I remember... The staff and I first talked. First problem we had is, are the ceilings going to be tall enough to have a worship center? I mean, that's consideration. And we came to see it. The problem about it is, somebody had come in and stolen all the wire for the copper out of the place, so there were no lights. So we had to sit by flashlight. It's hard to tell anything by flashlight. But I did a couple of things. One of the first things I did, I called Donald Wesley. Dorothy's here today. Dorothy's moved on us. His wife's here today. Donald's gone on to be with the Lord. But I called Donald Wesley because I knew Donald had been the city inspector. And I think that he had been the city inspector about the time that we were here. Uh, that, that this building was built in, I think, 89 or 90, something like that. And so uh, I called Donald and I said, Donald, we have an opportunity to buy the Dillard's building. What do you think? This is the first words out of Donald's mouth. He says, that is the best built building in Texas City. I'm thinking, okay, that's a pretty good, pretty good recommendation from the guy who inspected it. And he said, well, let me tell you what I mean. He said, Dillard's went over and beyond anything we asked them to do. He said, they put a better grade of steel than any other building that's in the mall or it's in Texas City. He said they, they, they did the highest grade of steel. He said they're concrete, they've got more piers, and, he started, and then he started telling me all kinds of stuff that they did that I, didn't, I don't remember and can't understand. But, but you know, when the guy who inspected this place says it's the best built, built, building in Texas City, you kind of go, oh, uh, that sounds kind of decent. And then I did some research about, because if we stayed at the other place, we were going to build a worship center, and so I called the architecture department of Baptist General Convention of Texas, and I said, how much would it cost us to build a new worship center where we're at? And I told him our situation, that we had opportunity to buy this, or we could stay where we're at. And he looked at me, and he said, I think it would be about six and a half million to build a worship center, 500-seat worship center. Well, I get to looking at that, a 500-seat worship center, no fellowship hall, inadequate classrooms, no children's area to speak of, versus all the room we have out here. That seemed like a no-brainer. And folks, I'm just going to tell you something. We've saved money by doing this. Because not only would we have had to build a worship center, that say 500, by the way, we can put 750 chairs in here if we need to. Uh, but not only would we have had to spend the money on that, which, you know, truthfully, to buy this and to repurpose this was not a lot more than six and a half million, and we have everything. Uh, but over there, we would have eventually had to build a fellowship hall or a gym, and we had to build more classrooms. I'm telling you, we saved money by coming here. And it was very interesting that when this place came up, how many of our Texas City folks well, this is okay, because that's Texas City. For some reason, a mile down the road isn't Texas City, but this is. And so there just became more of a unity within our body once we decided to buy this and, and all. Now, 
getting here was very difficult because it was very hard to sell the 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 uh, property over there we had two sales fall through and then the guy who did buy it kept putting the the closing date back and knew how to do that but you know we're here and uh, this is how I look at this building folks I look at it as a gift from God um, I've been told by architect and engineers and all that in order to build this building from scratch would probably be about $60 million. And that doesn't include 12 acres of paved parking lot. I can tell you, and I don't have the exact figures, but we've got about eight and a half to nine million in this place. That's a gift, folks. There are not many churches that have such a facility as this. And uh, God has gifted it. I feel like we've done a good job. I feel like the committee did a great job. Our contractor did a great job. But we tried to keep some of the character of the Dillers Builder and some of their great things like the marble floor and the, the coves in the, for the entryways. I think all that has, we, we've done a good job with that. So that's our story. Or at least it's a story according to Robert Miller how it went. <laughs> Remember, history is what historians write or tell. I want to get to the scriptures. There's some scriptures that have been very important to us. Ronnie Hazard, when he became chair, started quoting a verse uh, very quickly. And it was the 127th Psalm, and he quoted it all the time. He put it in all of his writings when he was reporting to the church what was going on. And it's the 127th Psalm. I won't have you stand on this one, but this is what it says. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. That passage, whether you know it or not, is a psalm that was written for the pilgrims who were coming to dedicate the temple for the first time. Uh, they came to the temple three to four times a year from that lion regions. It would come during the feast, it would come during Passover, and some different things. But they had this cool thing that they did. Those, especially from the Galilee region, if you've been to the Holy Land, you'll know what I'm talking about. But the most traveled route to Jerusalem was down to the Jordan River and down the Jordan Rift Valley they would walk. And when they get down to about Jericho, around the Dead Sea, that is the lowest place on earth. Uh, and, but what's interesting is when you get to Jericho, there's a mountain right there where Jerusalem's built on top of a mountain. And so the, the, those coming to the, uh, to the temple or when they would walk for those feasts and things, when they hit Jericho, they would start singing the Psalms of Ascent. And they would do that all the way till they reached the temple. Solomon had them... Uh, he wrote this psalm for the occasion for, the, for them to sing when they hit Jericho, for them to sing up. And they, that's, that's what they would have seen. Uh, unless the Lord builds this house, it is built in, in vain. Because they considered the temple the Lord's house where he stayed. There's another passage that we talk a lot, of, a lot especially around 4th of July. And that's Second Chronicles 7.14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. Let me also say that passage is from the dedication of the temple, when Solomon dedicated the temple. So I want us to stand and read a few of those verses. If you would, this is from Second Chronicles chapter seven, beginning with verse eleven. Solomon finished the temple of the Lord, as well as the royal palace. He completed everything he had planned to do in the construction of the temple and the palace. Then one night the Lord appeared to Solomon and said, I have heard your prayer and have chosen the temple as a place for making sacrifices. At times I might shut up the heavens so that no rain falls or command grasshoppers to devour your crops or send plagues among you. Then if my people, 
who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and restore the land. God's word for God's people. You may be seated. So God appeared to Solomon. Solomon had built a temple and he had prayed and God appeared to him one night in a dream and said, okay, I have heard your prayers. I'm answering your prayers. This is going to be a place where I will accept sacrifices. But here's the deal. I want it to be a place of prayer. I want it to be a place where people will gather. And when during bad times, like pandemics, it needs to be a place of prayer. And I am fearful that during the pandemics, people have got used to staying at home. So, well, I can stay home and watch online. Or I can watch all these great preachers on TV, and you can. I watched one this morning. Enjoyed him. David Jeremiah, great. But it does not take the place of literally coming and physically being with God's people and praying with God's people. So, I want to talk about church buildings for a minute. Uh, the church building is a place for God's people to gather. Now, let me start off by saying this. And it's obvious, and you all know it's obvious, but I'm going to say it. Buildings do not make a church. The people do. The building is not the most important thing about a church. The people are. If this building got tragically tore down, and I think it would take something because I think next hurricane I'm riding it out here. <laughs> uh, but, but if it tragically got torn down somehow, we'd still have a church. We'd still have one. But in saying that, to say that buildings aren't important is just dumb. Uh, I hear this all the time. I've heard it from some of our people when we were building this and, uh, and all. And uh, those folks, most of them aren't with us anymore either. So that's okay. The remnant is here. <laughs> but, uh, but they would say, you know, the early church didn't have buildings for the first, you know, three centuries. Well, yeah, that's right. But why didn't they have buildings? Well, it was illegal to build a church. Christianity was not a recognized religion until Constantine. If they could have, they would have, because once he made it legal, baby, there were churches popping up everywhere. Over in Antioch, Syria, which that, that, they built one there way back then that stood until the dead gum ISIS people tore, got to it. And all here recently in the last few years. But, but buildings have always been fairly significant. Now again, they're not the most important thing, but they are significant. They're a place where we can come and worship. A place where we can look forward to being. And I hear people saying, well, you know, China's got this church. It's a house church, and they're all growing like that. Well, if you read the history behind that, uh, you know, Watchman Nee was one of the ones that got that going because he realized that when the communists took over, he, they were going to outlaw the church, and so he wanted to have it where it would survive. So he wrote Bible studies and things so they could have house churches, and it did survive. It's not only survived, it's thrived. Uh, we talk about China and all like that, but you know, there's a huge Christian element over there. I think someday there's going to be a Christian prime minister of China and going to change things. I'm praying for that. But... Uh, but people say, oh, there, look at the church in China. They don't have buildings. Well, let me tell you something. If they were recognized to be legal, they'd have buildings all over there. The reason they don't have buildings is because they can't have them. So don't listen to a lot of those arguments, okay? They're silly. Because it's good to have a place where people can gather. It's important for you to gather at church. Church is important. And I know today the church is supposedly declining. There's all kinds of people questioning church. I know people who have written very huge works and popular works in Christianity who said, I'm not, I'm through I'm the church. That's silly, folks. And I can give you personal experience. I have a whole sermon on this, and I'm not going to give it to you right now. I may bring it back out 
because I think we need to hear it again. But just making a bottom line, I believe Jesus Christ died to found the church. I believe that the church today is the kingdom of God on earth. And it's not invisible, it's to be visible. And if you stay at home and you do that, guess what? You're an invisible church. The Bible never talks about an invisible church. It talks about a visible church. It talks about a church at Corinth. It talks about a church in Rome. It talks about a church in Jerusalem. That's a church. They met. They worshiped. They ministered. They sent people out. We need a place to gather. We need a place where people can come and pray together and minister together. Another thing that is important is that church building is a symbol that gives testimony to the community. Now, I found that out the hard way when we voted to sell the church at Ninth Avenue and it got torn down within about a couple weeks after we sold it. I could not eat in Texas City for about three months. Not because of church members. I mean, I had some church members mad at me too. But there were people in the community coming. They, they would come, I would, I would try and eat. And they, community members come up and go, I can't believe you tore that down. That was a symbol here in, 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 in our community. It was something, and I got chewed out. I, I got where I wouldn't even eat in Texas City. Wouldn't stop Texas City. I came to the church and then I left. Uh, I, it, it, was, it was an interesting time. But I understand it. It was a symbol to them. It was a landmark for them. They looked at that and they thought, okay, there's church. Now, most of them, they didn't come to that church. In fact, I found what was interesting. There was a guy who was complaining to one of our church members. And he said, I can't believe they're tearing down that church. And his kids had been in upward basketball. They came to vacation Bible school. His kids went to camp, did all this kind of stuff. He said, I can't believe with all the ministries they got that they're going to up and leave. And uh, the guy he was talking to said, you know, you sent your kids to upper basketball, vacation Bible school. Uh, you send your kids to camp, camp, but you don't belong here. You drive, you know, 30 miles to go to church somewhere else. He said, maybe if you who did that stayed, they would be able to rebuild right here. So to have moved. I thought that was a pretty good answer, but, but I do think it's a testimony. And I want you to know something. This church is a testimony. I have, I've had people stop by and say, Pastor, we see the big cross everybody, every day, and we, we go to work and we drive by it, and it does something to us inside. Now let me tell you what I desire. I desire that this be a holy place. Now, I know that we don't worship in buildings. I don't believe God is, is stationed here. But I do believe it can be a holy space, don't you? It is my prayer that if somebody gets out of their car in the parking lot, they feel the presence of God. When they drive by and they see our cross, and they do like that, and, and it's sometimes hard when you repurpose a uh, building like this to have much symbolism in it, religious symbolism, because if you build it from scratch, you can do stained glass like that. But we've done some. Notice it. We've got two small crosses on both ends and a big cross in the middle. And now you all recognize the symbolism of that. Jesus dying on a cross between two thieves, but the main cross there. If you'll notice, the same thing is, is out in our baptistry. We've got two crosses in the floor, and one in the baptistry now. And by the way, it's the same one we had over at the Ninth Avenue baptistry. Looks good in there. We have a, a baptistry of living water. If you look in the Bible, living water was very significant. And I'm going to be doing some sermons on that in the next few weeks about baptism, living water, and things. But that's, that was intended to be symbolic. The infinity pool, the pool going, standing for like the Jordan River, going through like that. And also, somebody pointed out the other day, I hadn't even noticed. When you walk in the front door, it's open all the way to back, and then we have our two hallways. It makes a cross. And then, truthfully, those 
Uh, you can talk to staff and they can tell you if I'm lying or not. But we were over at Gringo's one day, and we were looking at those arches, and we knew the builder's building was empty. And I said, you know, those arches look like a church. Uh, looks like a church building. And lo and behold, years later, here we are. But I think we give a testimony to the community. Also, the church building is a place of refuge from the world. Our world's messed up. Would you all agree with that? I mean, you watch the news, you get depressed. We need a place where we come and where Jesus is magnified and where people actually want to give love to God and love to each other and want to speak kindly to one another. Want to, want to build each other up instead of tearing each other down. We don't want to cancel anybody here. We want to build you up. It ought to be a place like this, and we all need a place like this where we can come and know uh, one of the values we have, and I, I may be doing that later in the summer. One of the values we have is we can build a shame-free environment where you can come in and know you're not going to be judged, but somebody who will help pick you up and help you live for Jesus. And then the church building is a place to pray with other Christians. That's what the temple became. That's what the Psalms became. I always thought the Psalms were a hymn book until I started going over to the Holy Land. I quickly found out it's a prayer book. I pray the Psalms. If you go to the Western Wall, or what has been called the Wailing Wall. They have right off the side of the men's area a Torah room. And I was down there with Dr. Scott McKnight, who's a New Testament scholar from Northern Seminary in Chicago. He and I were down there at night one time. We saw a Torah room, and he said, you think they'd let us go into that? I said, well, we can go in. If they kick us out, they kick us out. So we went in, and, and all it was, they call it the Torah room, but all it was was just bookcases and bookcases of psalms. And when you go next time, if you'll look, a lot of them just have the psalm books kind of at the reading and praying psalms at, the, at there. Well, they came to pray because that's where they thought God stayed. Well, Jesus and all the others let them know that God's everywhere. God's just as much here this morning as he is there at the Western Wall. You can pray to God here, but there is a power when you come together as a congregation to pray. Jesus tells us there's a time you go in your closet and pray, but there's a time when it's very powerful for you to come as believers and pray together. I pray that that will happen. Well, we're going to make a couple of video dedications to the Nancy Walker Choir Room and the Grace and Glass Memorial Baptistry. John wrote in his article this week, I thought of a good insight, he said, Baptists don't do sainthoods. Well, of course, our theology is that everybody who's a Christian is a saint, so we don't do sainthoods. But if we did, uh, Nancy Walker and Grayson Glass would be saints in our church, would they not? We'd have them up. I am glad that we're able to recognize them. I'm kind of somebody that thinks you don't get recognized while you're alive. But these two saints have gone on to be with the Lord and we're going to honor them by naming some things after them. And we have a video presentation of that dedication for you right now. We are in the Nancy Walker Choir Rehearsal Room, and I'm here with some friends, Tish Hart and Ron and, uh, and Elaine Mason. and. Uh, we just want to talk a little bit about the why we chose to name the choir rehearsal room after Nancy. Tish is going to share a little bit about uh, her involvement with her choir. Yes, at first I knew who she was, but I first got involved with her choir, and she was always so nice, so nice and helpful. And I w I can't say that I was friends of hers from, you know, 1950 or something. That's when our relationship began. Then when she had, I had breast cancer, then she had breast cancer, then I started taking her to the doctors, and then we started noticing that her mind was not as sharp, but she performed perfectly. Independent lady that I admired tremendously. And 
So I stayed doing stuff for her till she died. Wow. And it was very obvious that she loved the Lord and loved our church oh, and loved oh, to be a part of the choir and the music oh, ministry. Absolutely, well. absolutely. And she worked at the church for a while after being a school teacher, right? Yes, when she retired, she was not a sit home and let's do nothing kind of lady. And it just happened that the church needed a print secretary because she had taught English for all those years. She seemed like the obvious choice, but the best part of the job for her was being the music director's secretary. Yes. And it allowed her, even after she was no longer officially employed, she continued to do the music library, the music duplication, anything with music. She did it for our church. And even though she was employed here, she actually gave all that money back to the church, is that correct? Yeah, she worked you know, for a salary while she was employed here, but she always gave that back to the church. Then after she was no longer, quote, employed, she kept working for free, I guess you might say, doing everything that she had done before. And then when she came to the end of her life. Her estate? Yeah, her, her, her estate, her estate, her estate yeah, was given over to the church. Yeah. Awesome. And she always said that, you know, this is for First Baptist, this is for First Baptist. So if there's ever somebody that should have something at the church named after her, it was her. She loved the, the Lord, loved our church, loved to sing, and what better place than uh, the yes. choir, choir room to uh, name that a after her. And she's an amazing lady, mm -hmm. amazing lady, and good, good, good. I am really excited to be here in front of our new baptistry that will be known as the Grace and Glass Memorial Baptistry. Uh, it is exciting to me for two reasons. One, every church I've ever been a part of, it seems like the baptistry has been an afterthought. And I was glad that I was able to, as a minister, and I'd always promised God, I said, if I ever get a chance, we're gonna make a baptistry in a church the best it can be, the dressing rooms, the, the place and all. And uh, to be able to honor Grace and Glass, uh, who very special to me, as a great friend and, and great support to me, is a great honor. Uh, Patsy came up to me and she said, I wanted to give some money for the baptistry uh, to honor Grayson. And we got to talk and I said, well, why don't we let everybody get involved and really do something big? Do you remember that? Yeah, I remember. And I think we've done something big, don't you? Yeah, I think y'all did something big. I mean, we did do something big. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, what, you, what do you think Grayson would think of this? Oh, he would be he would be so pleased and so honored that it you know that it happened. And it's also a beautiful spot and the purpose of it is really pleasing. And we have Grayson's daughters here, Sherry and Luann. Sherry was on a building committee and actually if you look at the the, the tile and all like the coloring and all like that, that's basically Sherry had a lot to do with that. Not the only one. She had a lot to do with that, but Sherry, what did you think about the process? Well, it was just so interesting the way that you envisioned it being at the center of the church, where when you came in all the doors, it would be your focal point. And um, I really enjoyed working on it and helping you select the colors and everything. It was, it was a pleasure. Well, Ann, what do you think about it? I think it's great. It's beautiful. And it always, when I think of baptis baptism, of course, I think of the meaning behind it and the purpose, but I also think of some of the stories my dad had about some of the funny things that happened during baptisms and some of the poignant things that happened during baptisms. So um, I'm just really, I'm really proud of it, and I, I just think he'd be very honored. Yeah, well, we have a couple guys over here. We have Gary Cameron. Gary, Gary has kind of helped supervise this project from day one. He went out and, and he got uh, Brian Foley. Brian is a member of our church, and he's the one that did the plans. But kind of talk about how it got started and all like that, Gary. Well, it got started with the vision, like you were talking about, of a baptistry right in the middle of the building. And from there, it just grew. We kind of felt the uh, building committee, along with Sherry and, and the Glass family, kind of helped with the design, and we came up with the design. Brian and I, over a period of three and a half, four years, coming together, coming up with this final design, which we hand over, handed over to uh, Robert Swain, that's from Pool and Spa Artistry, artistry and uh, he came up with this, and uh, Sherry and I 
and Michelle went up to his office and got a, a video of it before we did the final on the colors and the tile and everything it turned out real well. A lot of people's already in line to get baptized here and we're just so thankful for the Glass family and the others that made financial contributions and contributions to their time and especially Ryan, as many revisions as we went through, he was trying to catch up, catch up on them, and I'll let him talk about that. I had a folder that was revised drawings, and there was 25 drawings in there. <laughs> so we did 25 revisions? Oh, I know it was more than that. <laughs> uh, so we've been through at least six or seven versions, and exactly. different things changing. Uh, so it, it, it's been a process. It has. Well, I, on behalf of the church, I want to say thanks to all of you all. This is possible because of, of your hard work. But we want to dedicate it, and I want to dedicate it in kind of a special way. Two years ago when I was in Israel, I knew we were going to be doing this someday. But I brought some water back from the Jordan River. And for those of you who may not know, the Jordan River is where John the Baptist baptized and where Jesus was baptized. And just symbolically of mixing the river from the Jordan where Jesus was baptized with ours, I'm going to let every one of these folks kind of put some in uh, our baptistry. So, Pence, if you'll start. That's it, we're gonna do a prayer of dedication. At this time, I would like for us to have a prayer of dedication for our building, for our Nancy Walker choir room, and also a prayer of dedication for our Grayson, Grayson Glass Memorial Baptistry. I mentioned before Jim Grant, our Director of Missions from Galveston County is here. I'm going to ask him to come and lead us in this prayer, if he would, a prayer of dedication. I always hear the phrase, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. We've, uh, I have four words I just want to put, uh, maybe encapsulate this, and I'm, not, I'm a preacher, so I won't keep you too long. But we've heard a lot of accolades about those that have made this possible. Dr. Miller, folks, I hope you understand what it took in having a leader with a vision to take it from plans to fruition. I think we owe him a round of applause this morning for being there. I've built buildings, it's not easy. Uh, not everybody is on your side. I know that David wanted to build the building first, but it was given to the privilege of Solomon. The place is all, often you talked about it. Well, it was Dillard's, and I had somebody actually tell me, well, that place will always be Dillard's. I disagree with that. Dillard's will go away, but the Lord will not. Amen. Location is... <laughs> the location was very important, not just for that day of building Solomon's temple, but what it would mean to the generations that would come and when we know that there will be Herod's temple, and we know that our Lord would actually go to that place. So location is important, but here's the phrase that we heard earlier, except the Lord build the house, the labors work in vain. This is the Lord's house. And God that day said, I will put my name on this place. The last word is very important. You said it was 30 years in making, uh, coming together and getting this done. You mentioned uh, Grayson Glass and Nancy Walker. 
those that 30 years ago thought about things, but not everybody was able to get it done. They have a legacy, the legacy of those that went before us. There's a legacy even here today for who are here. But what about those that come tomorrow and the next day? There's a very familiar verse. I'll read it real quickly, and then I will pray, and we can get to eating. It's been used many times because there are always difficulties, isn't there? And we live in a very trying time, and even in that Solomon uh, temple, it was a great, wonderful day. But there were hard times for Israel, but Israel was given a promise. Jeremiah 29, 11 says this, For I know the plans that I have for you. This is the Lord's declaration, plans for your well-being, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, as we stand here today, as we are gathered in your name, we cannot take this moment lightly. More than anything, our desire is to have your name on every lip, that we would bring you great glory as we fill this place of people that believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. For it is your church, and you said that you would build it, and so you have. So build it even continually through the lives that are here today and the lives that will come to faith in Jesus. Thank you for Dr. Miller, First Baptist Church, Texas City, those that have gone before, and those that are even looking down, thinking, and looking, wondering at what a mighty accomplishment. But today, Lord, we know there are people that need the Lord. Let us leave a legacy, not of stone and brick and mortar, but of lives that have been redeemed and will live in eternity with you. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you for this monumental day. And we consecrate it and dedicate it to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and say our covenant verse. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Matthew 6, 33. My blessing for you this week is to go and tell the marvelous, wonderful things of the Lord and invite your friends to come here with you.